by now you guys have seen my Nixie tube clock that I built in a previous video. A Nixie tube is an old technology that's based on neon lamps and basically each element is charged to a high potential and it, it causes the element to glow with respect to the uh, the anode which is a, a, a screen that's placed in front of it. Nixie tube was one of the original digital displays which is going through the slot machine effect there which is to minimize cathode poisoning. Uh, Nixie tube was one of the original uh, digital display tubes that was developed back in the 1950s and another old technology was one called a vacuum fluorescent display and I built a vacuum fluorescent display clock as well. Here's my vacuum fluorescent clock that I built. I've just got a blue um, plastic filter over the tube itself to make the numbers appear blue. Uh, both of these operate off of a high voltage. The Nixie tube operates off about 170 volts DC. The vacuum fluorescent operates between 40 and 60 volts. So they're both considered a high voltage display. There was another type of display that was also of the same era called a Panaplex. And unfortunately at this particular moment in time I don't have a Panaplex clock. I did build one the first digital clock, I've built about 10 digital clocks over the years, and the first project I ever built that had any type of complexity at all to it was a Heath kit. It's a GC1005. It was a Panaplex clock. I'm, I'm trying to find another one. I really want one back for my collection again uh, because it was the first kit that I built. Unfortunately, and it would have been, I would have been about grade nine, I think, at the time, my grade nine teacher. Uh, a man that Mr. My name was Mr. Adams, and we used to call him Mr. Bonehead. And I don't think he's probably alive anymore. And if he is, he's probably pushing 100 years old. But uh, he was very old at the time, very stubborn, and set in his ways. And he was wrong. And I remember that he wouldn't let me build my Panaplex clock in class because it was a line-operated device. So I wasn't allowed to build it because when you're in grade nine, you're allowed to work with like you know one and a half volt batteries you might be might get lucky if you could use a six volt battery but you weren't allowed to use anything that definitely plugged into a line plug but i i got this kit i think i got it for my birthday so i would have probably been about i don't know 12 maybe 13 years old i forget it was a long time ago but i remember wanting to build this kit and he told me yes i could assemble it in class but i could not connect it so following his instructions like we all did back then none of us knew really what we were doing uh, we proceeded to uh, solder this thing up using his techniques and that included putting that solder paste on that plumbers would use you know the stuff that's made with acid that you don't put on electronics well you know what happened to my panaplex clock the acid ate through the circuit board and well it was toast so my first one that I made I don't have anymore but I do have everything since then including an LED clock which I designed and I'm still I'm still using it it's got a about a five inch display connected to it now anyway um, these are a couple of the digital clocks that I've built but there is another technology and that's what I'm gonna build in this video and it's called a pneumatron now pneumatron was a an invention by RCA it's a seven segment display but this was before light emitting diodes had been invented and it actually uses incandescent filaments to form the numbers and it's the one that I always wanted to build but never did. Uh, I think at the time Radio Shack was selling they were selling uh, clock kits that used LEDs and the LED clock could be modified to use uh, the pneumatron tubes by just adding diodes to the uh, to the cathodes I believe it was but I never I never got around to building one of those um, I always wanted to never did we're gonna build one today using old school technology so stay right there we're gonna get the parts kit out I'm gonna get the gonna get the bench set up and we're gonna build a pneumatron clock today okay now that I've got the clutter on my bench somewhat back down to normal. I'm going to uh, start working on this pneumatron clock. Now for those of you that aren't familiar with what a pneumatron clock is, let's uh, open up the bag of parts here. 
and we'll uh, you I'll probably be using these things even though it's all through hole may not need them but let's take a look inside the, the, the parts bag oh, here's one of the here's one of the new pneumatron displays here okay and I'll get you a close-up of this thing but these are the these are the actual display tubes and inside here there are little filaments that form the number eight and they're driven by up to five volts and that way you can have variable brightness and they give a nice white incandescent color uh, these ones here are actually what do they call them IB9s I guess they're Soviet tubes RCA was the inventor of these and some of the RCA tubes are a little bit bigger these are the smaller ones that are soldered directly in as opposed to the plug-in style but they do the same thing the life expectancy on these tubes is something in the order of a hundred thousand hours so even running 24 hours a day these things are going to last for a long long time they used a lot they were used a lot in aviation for displaying frequencies on radios and so forth because they're low voltage devices unlike vacuum fluorescent displays which require a high voltage these operate at low voltage So here's the circuit board and we have a bag full of little parts. Looks like it's got a real-time clock module that's already pre-assembled which is fine. Put a battery in there that way it'll back up the time when the unit is not running. We have a buzzer, we have the USB power plug, got a couple of chips here. I love the way that they really put these into static protection. Looks to be there's four chips and one CPU. And we have some standoffs, a couple capacitors, uh, a photo cell. And there looks to be three resistors already stuck in the board. I don't know if they're in the right place or not, but they're already stuck through the board. And what do we got? A little switch here. This is probably to switch the alarm on and off. And I printed up some instructions, so uh, let's get mounting parts. This one shouldn't take too long to do. This is going to be a real uh, quick and easy build compared to the last couple of clocks that I built but that had hundreds of parts. This one has relatively few parts. So let's get working on it. So according to the instructions, they want the brass standoffs installed first. Looks like we're going to put the long ones on the bottom. And these top ones here, these are the screw to hold them together. That way it's ready for mounting in a, in a project cabinet or uh, even just display open. I might even just have this as an open display because I think it's kind of cool just to be able to see the working electronics of it. I did mount my Nixie tube and the VFD uh, clocks in a, a cabinet just because a vacuum fluorescent is so not getting a shock off 40 volts. Uh, but the, the tube itself is it's quite large and fragile. But uh, the Nixie tubes, they run at 170. so. We put that one in a wooden box just so that there's no chance of getting jolted because 170 volts would give you a bit of a kick. I'll show you something else I've got here. This is something i got to fix at some point. But uh, This is the Panaplex display. This is actually a stopwatch. And i got to figure out why it doesn't turn on. But uh, all the buttons for stop and start and lap and reset and stuff were here and this was the power switch I think that was the power switch and I'm pretty sure that's the power connector but uh, anyway this is this is the Panaplex display and here's the high voltage transformer because these run at about 170 volts these are neon as well they're what they call Panaplex plasma display and uh, they're, they're, they're pretty cool and w one of these days I might get this thing fixed and we'll see if we can get this thing working but this is the stopwatch that times down to the 100th of a second anyway I figured I'd show you guys that I don't know where I got this thing I found it somewhere and it, it used to work it used to work when I hooked it up but that was uh, that was the, uh, the first the first digital clock I built was used those Panaplex uh, displays 
Okay, first let's turn on the soldering iron here. First we're going to mount the USB connector. Okay, the next thing I think we'll mount will be the uh, we'll mount the IC socket for the for the big IC. Oh, wonderful! There's some pins missing off of this thing already. Check this out. A few of the pins are missing. I hope that they were in the bag. Oh yes, there they are right here. I have to reinsert the pins that are missing from the socket. Otherwise, we'll be mounting the IC right into the board, which is not generally what you want to do because uh, if you ever have to take it out for any reason and um, you're kind of screwed if you know what I mean but two of these uh, two of these pins fell right out on this thing I'll say something about the packaging of this thing um, it leaves a lot to be desired um, the seller of these kits should reconsider how he's selling his kits because I'm surprised that the tubes weren't actually crushed. I bought it off a Tindy seller out of the States and uh, I read some comments that other people have posted and they said the same thing that uh, it arrived uh, I guess one of the other people bought one that was already assembled, not as a kit, but because he sells these as a kit and um, fully assembled. And I guess when it arrived, some of the tubes were put, punched through the package, but they weren't they weren't broken. And basically, what this guy did when he shipped this thing is he put it in a photo mailer. If you can believe that, um, I already threw the package out. Or otherwise, I'd show you guys what he shipped it to me in but I, I couldn't I couldn't get over that he just put it in one of these mailers that you would put photographs in like just a, it's just a cardboard mailer the all the parts came in this anti-static shield bag with one little strip of I wouldn't even call it bubble wrap and the tubes were wrapped up in that and uh, everything else was just stuck into this cardboard mailer and say so when I got it it was just it was just the, the post office just beat the crap out of it and it, it, it I'm surprised that the tubes weren't broken that was the first thing I did when I when I got it and I saw the condition of the package I opened it up right away and I went and looked at the tubes to make sure that you know the getters were were, were broken right because these these will turn there's a getter in here being a vacuum tube this will turn like a milky white if oxygen gets at it so the uh, first thing I did was open it up to make sure that the tubes weren't broken and I breathed a little sigh of relief when I found that the tubes were in fact intact on here but uh, it was kind of, uh, I was a bit nervous there. I mean, I mean look at some of the ICs, look at, look at all the pins, they're all bent, right? This is, this is how it came out of the package. Um, it's just a terrible way if you're selling a kit, especially for what they're charging for these kits, you know, these, these aren't cheap. Right, I mean, the, the tubes themselves are the expensive part, but you know, for for what these guys that are selling these kits are are selling them for, you would think that they would put a little more effort into the packaging, at least for this one. The last the the, the, the packages I've received from Banggood have been properly packaged and properly shipped, and no damage. Like they're all wrapped up in bubble wrap. And um, the one I got from uh, PV Electronics, the, the Nixie tube clock, it was in a box and it was it was full of, of uh, styro chips, you know, very well packaged. So I didn't have to worry about that one getting uh, beat up. But this one here, on the other hand, well, as you can see, the uh, I mean, look at the socket here. It's just all it's all bent. All the pins are all bent. I got to straighten all these out before I install it in the board. You know what? I wasn't going to say anything, but I. I <laughs> After 15 minutes trying to get that stupid uh, IC socket in there, I'm getting a little bit frustrated here. This is the package. I found it. It was in the garbage. This is how he shipped it to me. Uh, what's his name here? Christian LZ. Right? He sells these on Tindy. And this is the way he packaged this up to ship it, which is totally inappropriate for shipping electronic components. It, it, there's no protection. I mean, it came in all 
you know, it was all kind of crushed when I got it. And, and again, I'm surprised that the tubes weren't broken, but I tell you, the pins are sure bent on these ICs, and it's gonna take me, I, I spent like 20 minutes trying to get this thing to line up, and the pins are all popping out of it now, I'm just getting frustrated, so. So I'm shutting the camera off while I'm putting this in, because it's taking a lot longer to insert this IC socket than it should. Well, finally I get this uh, socket in place. I can tack it in place now so it won't fall out. But uh, I tell you, when the when the pins are bent like that, it certainly makes it a little more challenging to try and get them all lined up. Because uh, when they're all twisted like that, what happens is they tend to they tend to catch the board when they're going in, and as you go to push the socket down, it just pushes the pin back up through the socket. So I had to take it apart, take it all out, straighten all the pins a second time, and uh, very carefully align it and get each of the pins in place. Okay, next uh, we're going to mount the electrolytic capacitor. There's only one of them, I believe, in this thing. And it's uh, 100 microfarad. So, of course, the electrolytic capacitor is polarized and it looks like the positive side is to the edge of the board. It's not uh, very clearly marked on here, but I can see the ground bus that runs around the board, so it's going to go in that way. Now notice I haven't removed these resistors that are just stuck through the board because it looks like they may have put them in the place where they go. There was three of them just already stuck in the 3R spots so they may already be in the correct location so I'm just going to leave them there until I get to that point of the, uh, of the build. It's a warm one out here today. Today is the first nice day we've had where it's been really quite hot. It's about, I guess it's about 22 degrees out today. So today is first day that it's actually been really quite warm and much warmer here in uh, the workshop it's it's probably closer to you know 28 or so degrees in here so I must be a total mind reader here because it says in the instructions to put the 100 a nanofarad ceramic disc capacitor to the back of the board and trim leads on the front and it says see image but of course the images that we get are black and white images they don't print up in color and I don't see the ceramic capacitor on here, although I can assume that it probably goes right here on the IC. The capacitor right here. Now I've got a little piezo buzzer. Piezo buzzer goes in here on the board positive to the edge. It says to stop and test, trim all leads from the bottom of the board, insert the Atmega into the socket, making sure the notch lines with the socket, yeah of course with the notch on the board. Connect to power and if you hear a beep, the microcontroller and the buzzer are working. Okay, let's put the uh, micro in here now. Normally I leave that for the end, but uh, they want me to straighten the leads on here and plug the micro in. And verify that it's booting up. But it should it should fit there. Now I just have to get a USB power source. Okay, let's plug it in. There, the micro and the buzzer are working. So we continue. Next we'll put all the push buttons on the board. And the alarm switch.
And now we have the uh, the four ICs. These are TPI uh, TPIC six B five ninety fives. These are going to be uh, the drivers, the decoder and driver. They're a seven segment driver uh, chip. And uh, the Texas Instruments chip, TPIC 68595. There's four of them. We'll put those in next. Solder those down to the board. Paying attention to the notch, which goes to the, the notch painted on the silk screen. Generally what I do when I install an IC like this is I bend over one pin on each side just to hold it in place. That way the IC is held in place and then I can go and solder it in. I'm going to put all four of them in, solder them all in and then we'll pick the video up. Okay, four ICs are installed. Time to solder them down. Okay, that's got the four ICs installed. Okay, I do have the light dependent resistor here. This is to dim the tubes out when, uh, when it's dark. It will adjust the brightness of the tubes up and down. That, I believe, goes here. Again, it's not marked on the board and the instructions aren't, aren't clear. But it uh, looks like it probably goes right there. And we'll solder that one down. A couple of jumper wires that need to get put in as well. We'll do that before I mount the tubes. The tubes are going to be the last thing that I mount. Okay, I believe my transistors, where am I going to put them here? They go. On the edge of the board here and here, and the temperature sensor is going to be the one that's missing that goes in the middle. because these are marked with a little microscopic B for the base. And this other one's marked as an IC. My instructions here tell me that I have to connect two jumper wires. And one of them goes one of them appears to go over here over here between two of the switches. I say between pin two and pin four down here of the switch. So I have to connect the jumper wire down there. So one jumper wire from there to here. And the other one I 
and then it'll be time to mount the tubes. The other one shows it going to the right pin of the temperature sensor, which is not there. And it goes down here to the bottom right pin of the USB connector and the rightmost pin of the temperature sensor, which I don't have. The rightmost pin of the temperature sensor, I believe, is this one right there. If it goes up here to the bottom, the rightmost bottom right pin of the, uh, the USB power jack. Okay, I believe that's the wiring. Now it's time to. Uh, get the tubes out and get the tubes mounted. So probably the easiest way to prep these tubes is to trim the lead so that one lead is, each lead's a little bit longer than the next one. That way it makes it easier to uh, insert the leads one at a time. So I'm just gonna go around and I'm gonna start trimming the leads off. Make each one a little, as I go around, a little bit longer. That way I've got all my leads trimmed as I start from one end and work my way around the other. That way I can uh, insert each of the leads accordingly and i got to trim these up a bit better because my, my snips didn't cut them clean so I'm just going to redo these with my other cutters. So now we'll thread the tube down. This just makes it a little easier to do it this way when you start out with, with one lead longer than the, than the next. It just makes it easier as you go around the socket to, to put them in place. And now you're not fighting with all the, the wires the same length. The tube sits in just like that. Push the tube down. Tube's in place. Time to solder it in place. First of all, make sure the tube is nice and straight because once it's in place, it's not coming out. Okay, now I can go ahead and solder the pins in. These pins are pretty close together. There. 
tube number one soldered in place. We can apply a power to this thing to see what it, whether the first tube does anything. It should light up in a test mode, which it does. So that works. So let's uh, continue with the next tubes and get the rest of them installed. Once again, the tube is prepped, ready to install. Start at the longest and then work our way back to the shortest. So here's the longest, second longest, third longest, so forth. So we get all the tube in place, push the tube down so it's, it's firm, and solder it on. Of course, when you're soldering the tubes in, make sure that they're straight by just doing one leg first. That way you can push it all the way in, make sure that the tube is properly seated, and then once the solder hardens, it'll hold it in place. And then you can go around and do the rest of them. Because once you solder it in place, it's going to be almost impossible to try and adjust it. If it's not straight, it's going to be impossible or very close to it. Because um, the, you know, if you try to straighten these legs up while it's soldered in, you're going to break the glass. And then the tube is going to be out of vacuum and uh, it's not going to work. I got all my tubes in there and we'll plug it in and see what it does. It's uh, doing a test, it looks like. Let's just read the instructions and see what it says to do here. Okay, pressing the menu button, it gets into the different menus here. And it looks like there's 15 menus, so. Uh, 12, 13, where are we? 12. Uh oh. What does that mean? <laughs> Let's try setting the time. Menu. So to install the, the uh, real time clock, we're going to trim the 32K and the SQW pins off. And it says to uh, bend them at 90 degrees. So now it's going to go. Can be straightened out this way because it's going to mount down against the board. I'm just going to grab my pliers. Okay, and then it installs the four holes on the bottom of the board and solder from the front. Make sure that you match the image below. Where's the image below that I'm matching? Okay, so there should be four holes on here. And it goes on the bottom of the board. Uh, looks like it goes in like this with the battery towards the uh, Also, always double check before you install a component. I had initially 
place the, uh, the real-time clock in the opposite direction, and when I looked back at the picture, I realized that I, I had the board, I was holding the board the wrong way. Uh, the IC was up here on the picture. Right, the IC is up here, so I, I pulled the board out and turned it around before soldering it in place. Okay, I've got my battery installed, and uh, we're going to uh, power it up now and see what happens. That's a good sign. Ah, there's our time. So now if I set the clock, if I hit the hour button, I should be able to set the time here. How do we do it? One of these is minutes and one oh, minute hour okay if I press this one this should change the hour Get a read up on how to set the clock. Okay. Minutes. Hold the minute button. And we set our minute, so 49 now, it's 6.49, so. There's, oops, okay. And right now I'm in 12 hour mode, so there we go, 6.50. Time is now set. And if it's dim in here, the lights go down to dim. Now when this changes time, it should be a slow change. Oh, there goes the, there goes the date. I haven't set the date yet. So there's the date and then the time. So it'll cycle between the time and the date. So let's set the date. Now that the real-time clock is installed, I'll be able to set it. When I was playing around with the settings before, I didn't have the clock installed, therefore I wasn't able to actually set anything. So if I press the menu button, it's my brightness first of all, and then it's in 12 hour mode. Auto dimming, I don't need to worry about that. And then the auto dimming by photocell is set. Zero leading blanking is turned, is uh, on. I think that's it. One. Temperature display, doesn't matter. Uh, time date, how many times per minute? One, two, or three times per minute. Day of the week, here's where we set the day of the week. And it's, um, it should be seven. And the next one is day of the month. So today is the 20th. Oh, that's the month. This is off by one. I forgot about that. This is five. Ah, I'm a little too quick for myself here. Five. The next one, 12, is, what is this one? That's 20, I believe. And then the next one should be the, or is that the year? It might be the year. It's off by one. Forgot about that. We'll reset it again here. It should hold the time. Yes, it does. So let's go back into the setting again. 12 hour mode. Uh, three, four, five, uh, six. Six was the auto sensor, I believe. Yeah. Seven is the eating zero blanking. Eight should be temperature, but it's not. It's, or is it? Eight is. Eight is how many times per hour it displays the, t the date. That's off. That's off by one. Nine is going to be the day of the week. It goes to seven. 
right? So that's Saturday. And then eight will be the month, is it the date? 10. I think I skipped one there. 11 is the five and 12 will be the year, right? That's the year. So 2017, that is that, I believe. And then we, then we go back to time and now it should, it should switch between the date and the time. So you have to go through these programming to set the thing. There you go, 6.54. And this one, I believe, sets the alarm time. Yes, that's the alarm time. And if you hold it and then press the minute button, you can change your time. So if I change it to 6, if I say, if I say 6.55, and if I turn the buzzer on, it should beep. It's interesting, it doesn't have an AM, PM indicator. So I don't know whether it's AM or PM that I'm set for. That's like my Nixie tube clock. You have to have it in 24 hour mode when you set it and then you can switch it to 12 hour. But it, but it actually has an AM, PM indicator light that you can either have it select the AM or PM, but otherwise you can have the, the, the two lights flashing. There we go. There's the alarm. So that's it. It's done. Uh, another little cool little clock to add to my collection, a Numatron. Hope you enjoyed this build. And uh, there's the date, 05, not set right, 2017. I gotta set the date. So let's go back and set the date here. That's right, the day is first. I have to write that down, make it correct, because it's being correct here. Anyway, I'll fix that. Okay, step one, step two, three, four, five. Five was 23, that's right, that's the off hour. Six is auto. Seven was, uh, what was seven? The leading zero blanking. Eight was, uh, I forget. Nine, that was the day of the week, right? No, that's that's the day. That's Saturday. And then this one here was seven. This will be the date. Ten. Ten is the day of week. That's today's date, which is the 20th. That's what it is. I'm going to write that down. This is number 10. Step number 10. That's the one where the discrepancy was. That's 9, and that one's 10, and that one's 11, and that one is 12. <laughs> 11 is the month, right? 12 is the year, and that's it. These ones here don't show because uh, I don't have the temperature sensor installed. Unplug it, plug it back in. The time is maintained by the battery backup. There's the date, 05 20, 2017. There's our time. Hope you enjoyed this one. It was kind of a fun build. Instructions a little bit vague. Uh, the silk screening on the board was, a, was horrendous. It didn't really tell you a heck of a lot. Didn't tell you where the parts went. But all in all, it's worked out well. I like it. It's going to be added to my collection. Now all i got to do is get another Panaplex clock and I'll have all the display technologies that have ever been offered in a digital clock. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.